Hey, good morning students. Um, we are gonna start discussion of Things Fall Apart today by Chinua Achebe. Um, it's gonna be a brief little video thing. I wanna read you a little from the text and talk about a few things, and then we're going to discuss heroism, and I'm gonna give you some assignments to work on in the collaboration space. So I'm gonna start. Um, by reading you, the book opens with a quote from Yeats, and we read this poem, W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming. The quote is, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. So we talked in class about how Yeats thought that um, the world moved in these 2000 year cycles. And as we were, as he was living through the war, he thought we were coming to the end of one of those cycles, um, that, uh, that the end of the world was um, perhaps at hand. So, and he despaired. So Achebe starts his book with this and he titles the book, Things Fall Apart, taking a line directly from the poem. Uh, so you could think about that in context to Yeats. Um, think about what Achebe is saying about the world that he's going to be describing, a world in which things are falling apart. Then he goes on from there. When we start, we are embedded in the village and we start reading um, about a conquo. So give me one sec. Okay, I'll just read the first paragraph out to you. Okonkwo was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements. As a young man of 18, he had brought honor to his village by throwing Emma Lindsay the cat. Emma Lindsay was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Umuofia to Mambayano. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. It was this man that Okonkwo threw in a fight which the old man agreed was one of the fiercest since the founder of their town engaged a spirit of the wild for seven days and seven nights. So from there, there are a couple of things you could point out. Um, we see an emphasis on his physical strength, on his ability, which is so powerful, it's almost supernatural. And one of the things that we've talked about in this class a lot are the ways in which some of these texts um, depict some people as larger than life, some people as lesser than. Um, we've looked at um, we've looked at a little bit from Said's um, uh, text on postcolonialism to uh, give us some context for the ways in which, uh, if you are trying to justify colonizing a people, it's easier to do that when you've reduced them to being less than human, or sometimes made them seem um, superhuman, uh, animalistic, or uh, spiritual. So, so keep all of that kind of in the back of your head as well as you're looking at how a kunkwo is described here. I'm gonna read another paragraph. The drums beat and the flutes sang and the spectators held their breath. breath. Amalinzi was a wily craftsman, but a kunkwo was as slippery as a fish in water. Every nerve and every muscle stood out on their arms, on their backs and their thighs, and one almost heard them stretch to breaking point. In the end, a conquo threw the cat. So he wins his fight, and those lines stretch to breaking point. I'd like you to think about. When we talk about what makes heroism, what we normally do if we were in class right now is we would have a big whiteboard, and I would have you guys throwing out suggestions on you know, what kinds of jobs are heroic jobs, what kinds of roles that people play in, in our lives are heroic. And what, you'll, what, what usually happens in class is that, well, some people will immediately say that their moms are heroic um, or their dads. Uh, generally, we have a, a quick agreement that firemen are heroic. That's, that's the sort of classic um, hero that, that everyone's on board with, run into a burning building to save people, that's heroic. You are putting your life in danger, you are exerting strength generally, so there's a kind of physical strength that often gets associated with heroism, um, but there's also a moral purity. And 
that's a contrast. Sometimes when we talk, people will want to say policemen are heroic or um, military people are heroic. And I would, I would agree that they certainly can be. Um, but usually there'll be someone in class who will point out that, um, that due to the sea of racism that we're all swimming in, um, sexism, et cetera, uh, those um, policemen are not always heroic in how they implement their jobs. And certainly soldiers who are um, maybe given orders that are not heroic um, can engage in terrible things as well. So, uh, so those, those roles are not as uncomplicated as firemen. Sometimes we talk about superheroes. So one thing you could think about is Superman versus Batman, right? So Superman is generally portrayed, Clark Kent is a, a sort of moral force for good. Um, part of what makes him Superman is not just that he's from Krypton and is amazingly strong and has all of these superpowers, but that he always tries to do the right thing. And if you watch a TV series like Smallville, um, what you'll see is that uh, that's the sort of central struggle of the series is Clark Kent trying to figure out how to be good um, while also being a superhero. And that's a real contrast with something like Batman or some of these newer shows like Arrow or, um, oh, and I'm going to forget the name, or Batwoman, actually, where there's more darkness. There is a, a complexity of... Um, morality at the beginning. In fact, Arrow kind of was struggling with that from day one. That was the sort of central problem, is that he was trying to cleanse his city by killing all the bad guys, but in killing them, he sort of inevitably darkened his soul. And that's, and Batman was, you know, motivated initially by the murder of his parents, um, and, and ends up using sort of physical strength that he's built up and tech tools um, to wage war on criminals. Uh, and it's just, it's just never as clean cut as it is with Superman. So there's another set of heroes to think about. So what I'd like you to do for your assignment is um, bring that forward to think about where we are right now. I'm going to read you a little bit more from the text first. That was many years ago, 20 years or more, and during this time, Okonkwo's fame had grown like a bushfire in the Harmattan. He was tall and huge, and his bushy eyebrows and wide nose gave him a very severe look. He breathed heavily, and it was said that when he slept, his wives and children in their houses could hear him breathe. When he walked, his heels hardly touched the ground, and he seemed to walk on springs as if he were gonna pounce on somebody. And he did pounce on people quite often. He had a slight stammer, and whenever he was angry and could not get his words out quickly enough, he would use his fists. He had no patience with unsuccessful men. He had had no patience with his father. So here, Achebe starts complicating our vision of Okonkwo. When we first meet him, we just hear that he's strong, he's powerful, he beat the cat, he, he's as strong as someone who's beat supernatural creatures in a battle. Um, he's slippery, too, and that's, that's sort of an interesting description for a hero, right? Does that mean that he's physically slippery? Does it imply a certain moral slipperiness? Um, hard to say. And then as you go on, you hear that he is, um, when he couldn't get his words out quickly enough, he'd use his fists. He's quick to anger, and now we start seeing that he's maybe not as heroic as we thought at first. Um, one of the things that we want in a hero is that we want someone who is more reasonable, more understanding than the average person, where um, we might be struggling, trapped at home with our families right now to keep our temper sometimes. Um, the hero rises above, right? So Okonkwo, because he has issues with his father, is, is how this gets embedded, um, has this flaw at the center of his being. And I'll read one more paragraph. Uh, Unoka, for that was his father's name, had died 10 years ago. In his day, he was lazy and improvident and was quite incapable of thinking about tomorrow. If any money came his way, and it seldom did, he immediately bought gourds of palm wine, called around his neighbors, and made merry. 
He always said that whenever he saw a dead man's mouth, he saw the folly of not eating what one had in one's lifetime. Unoka was, of course, a debtor, and he owed every neighbor some money from a few cowries to quite substantial amounts. So, and then it goes on to describe how Anoko um, lives his life kind of floating around, eating other people's foods, not working, and then uh, jumps forward to, that was years ago, and when he was young, Onoka, the grown-up, was a failure. He was poor and his wife and children had barely enough to eat. People laughed at him because he was a loafer and they swore never to lend him any more money because he never paid back. But no, Onoka was such a man that he always succeeded in borrowing more and piling up his debts. Okay, so here we have this character, Onoka, um, Okonkwo's father, who is, likes the good life, um, likes to eat, doesn't really want to work and is willing to pile up debt. And that's clearly going to cause some problems for Okonkwo throughout the text. Um, he's ashamed of his father, and we see that play out in a lot of different ways as he tries to be a bigger man, right? But the question is kind of what constitutes a bigger man? So part of it here is an almost kind of Puritan sense of, you know, you do hard work, you get wealthy um, as a result of your hard work, and that is part of what makes you a big man in the village, um, something that Unoka has failed at. Okonkwo is very determined to be a big man in the village, and that's going to lead him down certain paths that we'll talk about uh, soon, but also cause him uh, a lot of grief and cause everyone around him a lot of grief. So here's where I want you to connect it to right now. So we are living through a time when things are falling apart, right? Everything that you thought was true a month ago has changed and we're all struggling with new definitions, with new ways of seeing the world, interacting the world, new ways of living. And we're looking to leaders. We, in fact, are in desperate need of leaders. This morning I was reading an article from the Washington Post talking about how the last two months of US leadership around coronavirus has been incredibly inconsistent in ways that have made things much worse, that um, have led to more deaths. Um, and this isn't simple, right? It's not a sort of simple, um, you know, everyone stays home and then we flatten the curve and uh, fewer people die because it's also true that when everyone stays home, that leads to massive economic costs um, that also end up leading to people dying. Um, so, so what we're hoping for in leaders are people who have a clear moral vision, courage of their convictions, um, hopefully some understanding of the situation. Maybe they talk to experts um, so they have good evidence-based data to base their decisions on. That would be nice. Uh, and. Uh, and then that they, they can tell us what we should be doing. And then we can argue about that. Um, and maybe we, um, we agree, we don't agree, et cetera. Uh, a lot of our leaders have not made it that far yet. So uh, we've had something of a vacuum in America on a lot of fronts. So th for the assignment, what I'd like you to do is think about during this time, who has been a hero to you and what, has, um, what have they done that has been heroic? So think about our actual government, think about our president, um, Donald Trump, think about Illinois, we have Governor uh, J.B. Pritzker, we have Mayor Lori Lightfoot. I'm gonna send you a link to some PSAs that Lori Lightfoot did um, that I think are a, a really interesting example of leadership in this crisis. Leadership that is, looks nothing like Okonkwo's leadership. Uh, I'd also like you to think about in your day-to-day -day life, who is being heroic right around you, right? Maybe you have healthcare workers in your family who are going into work. Think about how we are now praising doctors, nurses for being heroic. And it's interesting because uh, among other things, they are putting themselves at greater risk for the rest of us. This isn't really the job they signed up for. When you sign the Hippocratic Oath, it's not a wartime oath. It's not, I will, you know, put myself in harm's way to save others, right? The way that 
maybe a military oath or, a, or even a police oath or a firefighter's oath might be. Um, it's more concerned with other things, and yet these doctors are, and these nurses are, and the medical staff are, and the janitors at the hospital are. All of these people are putting themselves every day in a harm's way uh, to help protect us. So one thing you could think about and write about in your responses is, um, is it fair what we're expecting of them? Um, are you heroic if you don't actually have a choice about it? Um, who gets to be called heroic? So think about the class issues involved. We try and do intersectional analyses here. So um, do people see the doctors and the janitorial staff differently when they think about who at the hospital is being heroic? Um, how about areas like food service? Food service people are essential workers. Um, so they have to keep going into work. We all need food to survive. And you know, right now in Chicago, there are people working on the factory lines who have to work shoulder to shoulder because that's the way the factory is set up, um, often with inadequate or no masking and inadequate or no hand sanitizing, et cetera. And these are people who are, by and large, many of them are people of color. Um, you may have seen that in Chicago, even though our population is only 23% black, 70% um, of coronavirus um, deaths so far have been among the black community. So, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, many of that has to do with, much of that has to do with underlying health conditions, heart attacks, um, or heart problems, uh, diabetes, et cetera. But that just pushes it back further. Why do these people have less adequate health care to begin with, right? And I mean, you know why? Um, but you can talk about that and about how race intersects with class and what the effects are. Um, so do you think of your food service workers as heroic? Do you think of the pharmacy people at the drugstore um, or the checkout people at the grocery store as heroic? Um, how about the people who are driving trucks across the country um, in the midst of this um, who may be sick? who may have family members who are sick. Uh, so all of this kind of together, and what about, actually, and one more thing, what about the people who are at home and who are doing kind of the daily care aspects, who are, you know, I started this talking about how some people always put their moms um, on the list as heroes, and a lot of that is because they know that the, you know, feeding people multiple meals a day keeping the place reasonably clean. Um, <laughs> add on now trying to homeschool young kids when you have no training in homeschooling and the kids are going completely stir crazy from being trapped in too small a space for too long. Um, trying to keep your patience through all that and to be a moral center as well as a physical source of strength and doing the, the daily drudge work labor um, I would argue is a different, is a certain kind of heroism. So, all right, that's now <laughs> almost 20 minutes um, on the opening to Things Fall Apart and heroism. So this is your lesson for the week. Um, I might record some more, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if you actually watch this all the way to the end. I feel like I should put a, a bonus Easter egg here at the, at the end if you made it to the last minute of the video but I can't think what that would be, so um, <laughs> never mind about that. Um, go take a look at the assignments on Collaboration Space, and we will meet as in Zoom during class time today as just a check-in, see how everybody's doing. Um, again, the Zoom meetings are optional. Come if you can. Be happy to talk about the opening of the book. And keep reading. Uh, Wednesday, we will be looking at the incident where Okonkwo is, um, uh, decides that he has to be the one to kill his foster son, spoilers. But hopefully you all have gotten that far you were supposed to. So, and why he decides to do that and why it's a huge mistake. And his friends try to argue him out of it to no avail. Um, so, yeah, okay, that's it. That's the beginning of Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Uh, as tied to today in coronavirus. Bye.